Welcome to the NJ Spotlight Roundtable Series. In this program, the impact of Medicaid expansion on New Jersey's healthcare system. This program was recorded in Trenton, New Jersey on March 7th, 2013. This program is brought to you by Amerigroup Real Solutions in Healthcare, the Hospital Alliance of New Jersey, and the Nicholson Foundation. Panelists on the program today are Dr. Poonam Alek, former commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services and a board member of the Common Sense Institute of New Jersey. Raymond Castro, senior policy analyst from New Jersey Policy Perspective. Susanna Yanni, president and CEO of the Hospital Alliance of New Jersey Incorporated. John Kern, CEO of Amerigroup New Jersey Incorporated and State Senator Joseph Vitale, Vice Chair of the Health, Human Services, and Senior Citizens Committee. Moderating the program is Andrew Kitchenman, healthcare reporter from NJ Spotlight. In this program, Chapter 2, the panel continues its discussion of the issue. Moderating the program is Andrew Kitchenman, healthcare writer for NJ Spotlight. And, and I want to follow up on that big question, hopefully with with all of the panelists to get their perspectives on uh, with the implementation. What do you see as the biggest challenges facing the state? Um, and do you see the pieces that are uh, currently in place, such as not knowing exactly the amount of funding that the navigators are gonna receive, the navigators that are, are gonna be funded through the, the exchange, um, and then the, the mandates and penalties that are gonna be in place under the ACA. Do you see those? things that are in place being enough to, to reach the, the state's goals, or do you think the additional steps will be needed? And if so, what, what steps? Um, and, and Senator Vitale, I think, has already somewhat touched on that through uh, some of the legislation he's talked about, but I'd be interested in your thoughts on that, Senator. Well, I think that for a time, we did really good work in outreach, and when the state was uh, providing their share of dollars to the Department of, through the Department of Human Services that was matched by federal dollars, it was a million state, million federal, uh, at least at one time, we were effective, and we were able to reach, uh, provide dollars for organizations and others and, and, uh, that could uh, do the enrollment. There was some level of advertisement. There were bus placards, and there were, you know, pencils and, you know, yardsticks. But, you know, we also did some real thorough sort of advertising and marketing program that we had hired people to do, uh, the state hired people to do, that actually made a difference. And we saw that we stopped marketing the program. Uh, we saw a significant decrease and those in, individuals who are understanding the program, knowing that it existed, and actually enrolling in the program. So there was a real cause and effect uh, by not having those dollars here. Because for, for a, a, a quite a long time, and even today, it's, I think in some ways it's the state's best kept secret. You know, family care, Medicaid, uh, and even though Medicaid is you know, for you know, a childless adult, you have to be you know, so poor, you know, below 24% of poverty is unimaginable. So, I don't know even how you can find someone who lives below 24% of poverty unless you check under the overpass. So, you know, it's, it's a horrible way to live. And for those above 24%, there is nothing. And so what, this is, again, why the exchanges or why the expansion is important. All that's from 30,000 feet and very important. I think the other thing we should talk about, too, is the, is the provider network and being able, a, certainly being able to have enough primary care providers uh, or docs and, and nurse practitioners, you know, in the field, on the ground, doing this work. Uh, we know we have a, a primary care physician shortage in New Jersey, uh, and it's going to take a long time to correct that. You know, not long ago, I spoke to a class at Rutgers uh, Medical School, and there were about 40 uh, students, and I asked, by way of a show of hands, how many were going to uh, go into primary care or family medicine, and two raised their hands, uh, and the rest were going to do uh, uh, some other things. And that's great, uh, but to have just two uh, is really troubling. And so to, even if today we, we adopted the best program with tuition assistance and loan forgiveness, which by the way, we do have some of that, uh, it's gonna take years to cultivate and graduate uh, young men and women who will be primary care providers uh, for the residents and the patients of the state. Uh, I've written laws and I've introduced legislation currently that would expand the scope of practice for advanced practice nurses. Uh, and anyone who thinks that, well, well, anyone who thinks that that isn't a viable solution and a thoughtful uh, solution to uh, expand the capacity for patients in the state uh, is, I think, just wrong. 
Uh, nurses have the ability and the training to do this work. We changed the scope of practice a few years ago to allow them to diagnose and prescribe. Uh, and now we're trying to move them a, a little bit more away from this tether that they have to physicians where it really doesn't need to exist. To let them work independently uh, to the limits of their practice, limits of their license, and they do great work. Uh, we have the ability to do much, uh, much better in our school systems and to do outreach and to actually put advanced practice nurses on the ground in these facilities. We've, I've done some pilot programs in my hometown of Woodbridge and it's been very effective reducing absenteeism and increasing, yes, reducing absenteeism in the school, but actually also ab reducing absenteeism in the workplace when parents have to take off from work because they have sick kids at home that aren't getting better faster uh, where they will if they were treated sooner. Uh, so there are a number of ways in which we can address the shortage issue. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, but if we don't begin to work on this somehow, some way now, uh, we'll never get there. Uh, you know, I think we, Suzanne, smart that, to say that we should, you know, manage our expectations. Uh, but it doesn't mean that there aren't enough smart people in this room uh, and outside this room that can uh, actually make a difference and make this work. You know, years ago, we didn't think that we could do any number of things. Uh, in this state and across the country because it took too much work. Uh, nothing that's worth, uh, something that's as valuable and important as this uh, uh, doesn't require that much work. It does. So, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ray, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think there are a number of things that we need to do. I think the, the first thing is we need to, and, and I'm working with the New Jersey Healthcare Co Coalition, which as many of you know has been very ac active in, in the original federal legislation and has been very involved in the implementation um, of the Affordable Care, Care Act. And um, I think one of the first things we need to do is, is a, a detailed study of uh, the population that we're going to serve, uh, who are they and where do they live. Um, and then uh, we need to develop a comprehensive uh, outreach strategy with specific enrollment goals uh, based on that population and we need to have different strategies for each group. I mean obviously in terms of how we reach um, someone who's a age 60, who was an engineer, lost a job, no hope of getting another job. Uh, so he has zero income, that person could be eligible for the Medicaid exp expansion versus a, a college graduate living with mom and dad who doesn't have health care co co coverage. So how you deal with those populations are going to be very, very different. The materials that you, 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 you prepare physically, how, how you re reach them is going to be very, very different. This is a very, very diverse pop population and um, studies have shown that 78% of everyone who is eligible for the Medicaid expansion is not aware of that. And part of the problem here is that these childhood adults are eligible for the first time. I mean, we've never had this be before. So they don't know exactly what Medicaid is. And they certainly don't know how to apply for it. So, um, uh, and, and then once we have developed that strategy, we need to figure out, well, how much funding do, do we need? Um, we need to identify that funding. And I mean, unfortunately, once we, we do that, I'm, I'm sure we're going to be able to put funding. It's not going to be sufficient. We have a huge demand. Then the question becomes, how can we marshal uh, other resources? Um, I think we, we need to look at, uh, in terms of um, encouraging the public to be involved. Uh, I know in, the, in, in, fa in fa family care, there have been a focus groups which have shown that most people know about this from their neighbors and their relatives. Um, so we, we, we need to have a message out to the public that reaching out to these folks um, is really everyone's responsibility. Um, and if we all, and only by working together can we really improve uh, the, the health of, of, of our state. And also, I, I just wanted to add that on the Navigator pro pro program, the New Jersey uh, for Healthcare Coalition is um, co coordinating some, some, some of this. I, I suggest that you, if you want to be a navigator, I suggest, and we have folks from the coalition here, uh, that you might want to contact that organization if you want to be a, a, a navigator. At some point, I can explain a little bit about the, the Navigator pro pro program as well, but I can do that later. Thanks, Ray. Suzanne. Yeah. Um, just a couple of comments. I think this Medicaid expansion is going to be more challenging than the family care expansion in the past because, as we all know as parents, you do a lot for your kids that you don't do for yourself, right? And also, I think the point of contact, I think a lot was done through the schools. So you, you hit the kids there and you also hit the parents there. But now, as Ray said, you could have a 60-year-old person and you can have a college graduate. And so the point to, to touch those those people is, is varied. So I think it's going to be a little harder this time around to uh, enroll everyone. Now, for the hospitals, we are the point of contact if someone comes into the hospital. But I just want to give you a little perspective on why it's challenging to get uh, everyone enrolled who comes in. There are uh, federal laws called, an, uh, there's an EMTALA law that says you have to treat everyone who comes in. And you actually have to 
triage them and treat them before you're allowed to discuss anything having to do with how they pay or if they have insurance. So for somebody who just comes in and is an emergency room kind of treat and release patient, the hospital does its best to say, and now you are going into this room to discuss you know, what programs you may be eligible for. Some people don't go to that next room because they've already been treated. So um, I just want to put that little layer of reality there because you know, we do have the patient, we are the point of contact, but it's a lot easier to get them enrolled in Medicaid um, if afterwards they are, you know, if they're admitted, you have them in the bed, the financial counselor goes to visit them. But if they're emergency room treat and release, the patient can just walk without actually, um, you know, hearing, hearing the financial counselor out. So just a little dose of reality there. Thank you. Dr. Ale. Um, I think the rest of the panel has talked about some of the key issues that are actually going to be very uh, critical in making sure that this is a successful implementation because the state can only put together a blueprint, but the implementation and really coming up with the best practices is our responsibility. Um, so when you come, uh, in addition to the physician shortage issue, uh, the, the important thing is how do we retain our physicians because they're leaving the state. 32% of physicians who finish their residency actually pr practice in our state. So those are some of the shorter term solutions we're going to have to look at, whether it's malpractice reform or whether it's um, looking at loan redemption programs. But again, expanding the scope of primary care and getting other non-physician providers involved as part of the team is going to be critical. In fact, there's a lot of literature out there that talks about advanced uh, practice nurses and nurse practitioners who do a much better job in primary care than even the physicians because they spend the time. They, they do uh, go through the preventative screening um, uh, elements of care. So those are going to be some of the things we're going to look at. Telehealth, telemedicine, EICUs, EEDs, you know, things like that that we're going to be doing electronically are going to be critical. Um, obviously, we talked about the enrollment and engaging the community so that they do uh, come on to the exchanges because that's going to be your central uh, single point of entry. And so how are you going to integrate that with uh, the new insurance subsidies? But the important thing, at least for me, um, that I think is going to be critical uh, stems from a, a discussion I had with a physician just last week. And he was telling me about uh, this patient of his. Uh, had no idea how sick this patient was. And as part of the Accountable Care Organization uh, initiative, we're getting all kinds of data from CMS right now. So he pulls up, the patient's supposed to be coming and seeing him, pulls up the data that, uh, in terms of the utilization, and realizes that over the past year, this patient has utilized a, a health care cost of $220,000 with 20 admissions, and he had no idea that this was happening. So he gets back with the rest of the specialists who are uh, taking care of these patients. They come up with a plan. They come up with a home care a solution for this patient, uh, put her into rehab, COP had, had lung disease, put her in a, an appropriate rehab program, and start managing the patient and start talking about palliative care. So this is sort of an, an example of what we have to do if the Medicaid program is going to be successful. We need transparency. We need data. We need data at the point of care to understand where the gaps in care are. How are we going to bridge it? What is the best solution? Well, how fragmented is this care? And how are we going to bring all this together? And then to be reporting on quality, because it, is, it has to be competitive. We have to be looking at what is the best solution for what population segment. Something that we talked about earlier is what is this population going to look like? What are, how are we going to stratify them? How are we going to risk allocate them? What are those targeted interventions that are going to take care of those specific segments of our population for which we're going to get the best possible outcomes? Those are going to be key, and that's where we as a healthcare community will have to come together and make this seamless, in addition to being able to integrate behavioral and, men, uh, and, and physical health. That's going to be critical if we're going to be able to uh, succeed in Medicaid. Senator Vitale wanted to follow up. Oh, OK. Uh, you don't want to cut me off, Senator? <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'll say nice things. Um, no, uh, I think it's really education, and, and really it's education for, for three groups. It's members, which we've talked a lot about already. Um, and I'm not just saying this because Senator Vitale uh, let me speak, but you know, New Jersey's going to be a little bit different than other states in the fact that due to Senator Vitale's leadership, 
single adults in our state have had coverage previously. So is that going to make us a little bit different maybe than other states? And, and as I think about education for policyholders, you know, there are a lot of new variables out there that are going to change the dynamics in the marketplace. One, you've got the subsidies and the commercial exchange. Two, you've got other states that even if New Jersey isn't advertising perhaps as much as we would like, New York is going to be, we would expect. What's that going to do? There's some other, you know, the, the consequence of the federal tax penalty, even though none of these people will actually have to pay it because the, the cost is far above the hardship level, how is that going to impact people in terms of their enrollment? So we're going to have to be agile in terms of adjusting to what are the effects of these policy changes that we've made. The other thing I would say about provider education, one of the important steps of the ACA is primary care doctors will get paid at 100% of Medicare. Now, it's only for a two-year period. Frankly, it's taken a lot to get that off the ground, but I feel fairly certain a large number of providers don't realize that is supposed to happen. At some level, they don't realize it because it isn't happening, but once it does, and what does that do in terms of PCP availability, so on and so forth? And, and the last thing I would say, Obviously, I think Senator Vitale and I would disagree in terms of the degree of PCP shortage in our state, but undoubtedly, as the Senator points out, scope of practice here in New Jersey for nurses needs to be expanded. We're behind other states. Those sort of common sense changes should be made regardless of sort of where we, we stand in terms of supply. They do a great job. Why would you cut somebody like that out from the market? But for me, it's really education to those three groups. Thank you, John. Uh, Senator. I just want to follow up on two things. One, what Suzanne said and, and John. Uh, first, I think we have to talk a little bit about accountability. Because we have all these great ideas and programs in place now, and sometimes there just isn't accountability. So Suzanne talked a little bit earlier about, you know, really tracking down that patient who presents at the emergency room. You can't ask them out of the gate if they have insurance, although they're probably, some can be creative with that, but it's about what happens afterward. Uh, but, you know, we have an opportunity to gather that information. And we do that now, and we're supposed to be doing that in our schools. So when, when you know, parents send in that slip with all that information on the contact information, uh, there's now a checkoff that we did that asks whether or not that parent has insurance, or whether the child has insurance. And then the state is supposed to follow up. You know, we could think about doing that in some of our hospitals or points of contact where people leave without answering the questions, but their information, I know there's some HIPAA issues, but we're not asking for something that's that dramatic, is it not insured that we can, that the state can follow up electronically through the, through the hospitals and the information they provide uh, to send those uh, individuals applications or information about the program. But there has to be, there has to be thoughtful, has to be thoughtfully you know, sort of designed and produced. Uh, then it has to be accountability. And, and I say that because what's frustrating now, and we have this program, which is you know, family care, and you know, we, we have told our schools uh, that, and asked our schools that when you get that slip that says your child is not insured, or that student's not insured, that information is supposed to be electronically uh, communicated to the state, and the state then sends the information to that parent. Cities like Newark and Camden and others, some of their biggest cities, with some of the most uninsured children are not doing that at all. And it's just, let's give one example, uh, not doing that at all. And so we're gonna, I'm going to maybe begin to address that issue. Why isn't it that they can't send that information that's on a database, this isn't about paper and work and having to pay someone thousands of dollars to send this information, even if they had to do that, so what? But to send that information in, what are they waiting for? So you've got thousands of kids who don't have health insurance and they could potentially have it, or at least some of them, if those parents had the information. So what I'm saying is that there has to be accountability in all of this. Accountability for me, who write these crazy laws, and then for those who provide the information and provide the services as well. Right. Yeah, um, I just wanted to follow up on that. The, um, in term, and I think to, you know, to support the, the senator here, um, um, when, when Andrew was talking about the 100,000 about um, who are going to go on the rolls. Those are the childless adults only, okay? Also, there are, there are folks who are currently eligible where we expect an increase in, in enroll enrollment, which is sometimes called the woodwork effect or, the, or the, the welcome mat effect. So as they hear about the program, more people are going to apply. And in the budget, the assumption is that there, many of these people are going to apply because 
uh, of that, and also the, we have the, the individual mandate. Um, so in addition to the, to the 100,000 who are going to be at 100 percent federal matching funds, there's gonna, they, they estimate about 60,000 parents um, are also going to be at, uh, going to in, enroll. So that's 160,000 adults, plus which ch more children are expected. I, I don't have those numbers right here. They expect a substantial number of children and, and adults at the, at the welfare level will be applying as well. So the total number who are going to be going on in, and going into HMOs is, is much, much higher than the 100,000. And I know we've been talking a lot about enrollment, but we also need to think about the, the other side of this, which is what kind of benefits are, are they going, going to get? And here, there's a great deal of, of flexibility in the, in the expansion. It's one of the most positive pieces of the, la the legislation. I think it's in line with what was, has been said earlier, that we, we need to sort of transform Medicaid and, and look at it in a, new, in a new, new, new way. The way we've done benefits in, in, in the past is pretty much follow federal re re regulation, some things you have to do, and then, they, then you have options that you may, may or may not want to do. Here we have very broad flexibility, and we have an opportunity to actually have a benefit package that is better than what is in Medicaid now, and we can target it to this group. So, I mean, we know a lot of these um, uh, adults have substance and mental health problems, so why not target those services? And there are other services as, as well. So, so we should really look at this in a, di a, di a, di a different way rather than just have a flat benefit package. Let's look at the needs of this particular population and then provide the services to meet those needs. Thank you. I went, oh, John. Yeah, if I might follow up sort of on, on Senator Vitale's point, I, I think he's exactly right in terms of the accountability, but also in terms of some, there are some very basic things we can do as a state that will make some very real differences. Um, and, and one of them, as the Senator is getting to, is demographics. How do you reach these people? What's the contact information? Um, the state Medicaid De Human Services Department has had a longstanding effort to improve their enrollment system, their demographic system. I'm optimistic that that will make real differences. A concern I have is just if you think about changes in the last 10, 15 years about how we all talk to each other, it's, a, it's affecting the Medicaid population as well. They do use cell phones but frequently they buy the disposable type, so the number's changing. And one of the key, you know, a very simple thing, not necessarily a simple idea, uh, but maybe difficult to execute, is if the state could store multiple phone numbers because these phone numbers change, you know, our ability to get in touch with people is really vital to educating them. So I, I think the senator is exactly right. There's some very basic stuff that we got to do that can make a big difference, but we got we to gotta pay attention to it. I wanted to return to the point you made about the uh, increasing uh, reimbursement for or payments to me Medicaid uh, f for doctors who, who treat Medicaid patients. Now, that my understanding is that that's already gone into effect in a sense, in that any care that doctors have provided since January 1st will receive that elevated level. But uh, because of delays in the federal uh, regulations, now there have been delays in the state uh, regulations. So. Um, doctors aren't really aware of, uh, some doctors are aware of it, but they're not aware of how it will work or, or when that will come in. Any thoughts from the panel on, on whether this will be significant in increasing the number of doctors who will treat uh, patients who, who are in Medicaid? Well, well, let me say a couple things first, if, if I might. Um, one, you're absolutely right. So doctors already provided the services will get that payment. Um, unfortunately, you're also right, and it's true, I think, in all 50 states at this point, nobody's been able to implement it at this point. The federal government's demanding some real accountability in terms of making sure that the feds are paying for this increase entirely. So there are accountability issues and states have to submit plans to the federal government before that gets approved. So there's unfortunately a lot of gears in place that, that, that have to happen before the, the money uh, gets out into the doctor's hands. In terms of whether, whether it will work or not, I'm optimistic, but as I said before, in terms of need for education, this is one of those issues policymakers are going to have to follow and potentially adjust to. One of the, the big frustrations in our business is 50% of all doctors in New Jersey, if you call them and you say Medicaid, that ends the conversation. They don't want to have a discussion with you about how much we'll pay you. That's it. They don't want to talk about it. So 
hopefully this changes that percentage in some way and there can be better recruitment. Whether that's going to work or not, that's just one of those unknowns and until that policy is out there and in place, you don't know. But I do think it's vital to, to Senator Vitale's point, accountability. We've got to get this done, got to get this done sooner than we've gotten it done so far. So not sure, but hopefully it does have an impact. I, I, I would agree. I mean, I think in addition to um, ac accountability, we really need to look at this from a more broader planning per perspective. I mean, you know, a, a lot of the, in, in the Affordable Care, Care Act, there are a lot of opportunities. But if this is really a partnership with, with the state. Uh, you know, I, I agree that if, if all, all we're doing is simply increasing uh, the paycheck, fr fr frankly, of primary care physicians, it's going to have very little impact. But we should really, and, and by the way, this is going to have, um, we're, this, we're talking, I believe, hundreds of millions of dollars here. So this is not a small initiative. Um, because New, New, New Jersey was um, either dead last or very close to dead, dead last in, in the country. So it, it would appear the reimbursement rate is going to be about doubling. Uh, so so, so that, that, that's very positive. But we need, but with this happening, we then need to have sort of a strategy of how can we use this as an opportunity to um, develop, you know, first of all, assess where the, the, the need is in terms of more pr primary care for physicians. And then try, try, try to use this as a way to encourage uh, physicians to participate in the program. Simply mailing a check to them is not go going to do it. The state has to do a lot. I think the HMOs have to do a lot. I think the, the, the Medicaid uh, a division needs to have some, some account accountability standards. Uh, we need to have, have, have some goals. So we, we need to address the entire issue of reimbursement and any, any shortage that might exist with respect to, to primary care uh, physicians. Um, so again, uh, being a physician and having talked to uh, a few physicians about this, I've got mixed reactions. So some of them are excited because again, to your point, we're amongst the lowest when it comes to our Medicaid fee schedule. Uh, and some of them, uh, a lot of them actually, uh, are saying, well, this is just a two-year fix, so what's going to happen after that? Now I have a relationship with my patients, I can't abandon them, so should I even go into that? Uh, and my advice as I'm talking uh, about this issue is that this is sort of the, the roadmap to how things are going to change and how we need to be making uh, things like our Medicaid accountable care organization successful. So now as a group of providers, we start looking at the care, uh, the comprehensive care for these patients and then at the end of it, if the projected savings is, if there are any projected savings, then everybody gets a piece of those projected savings if the quality measures continue to rise. Now, the Medicare Accountable Care Organization is based on that premise. And I have to tell you, the, the third party pairs, the commercial pairs, have been really great at ad adopting what's happening in terms of changing how uh, we're reimbursing for health care. And there have been the catalyst to what's going to happen in the next few years when it comes to making sure that we're paying for good outcomes, not purely for utilization. So, so if we all we did was increase the, the, the fee schedule for two years, we've actually lost a huge opportunity. We have to do that in tandem to getting these physicians engaged, excited, and looking at those opportunities from the Affordable Care Act and seeing how we can mobilize it right here in our state and get the right partners together to be able to bring about successful results. So I see this the next two years as critical in terms of shaping what our Medicaid reimbursement strategy is going to be. For more information, visit the website njspotlight.com. We produce these programs in the studios of Lubetkin Global Communications in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at lubetkin.net. For everyone at NJ Spotlight, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us and take good care. NJ Spotlight, where issues matter.